Tonight on the In All Kinds of Weather forecast, Florida and Central Florida are going to do battle in the swamp. Four time ever meeting. This one has a little bit more meaning than the th previous three. We'll talk about all that and more tonight on the In All Kinds of Weather forecast. Welcome in to the In All Kinds of Weather forecast. Bit of a different cast today. Chris is still in Germany. He's actually um, just run the Berlin Marathon. So congratulations to him on that. He finished. Always an accomplishment. We'll talk with him about that more when he gets back. For now, though, it is myself, Neil Shulman. You can follow me at All Kinds Weather. A familiar face, um, especially for those OG listeners of the In All Kinds of Weather forecast. The guy I launched it with, Dustin Smith, all the way back in the height of COVID, stepping in today as the co-host of the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. As I mentioned a moment ago, you can follow me on Twitter at All Kinds Weather. Same handle on Instagram at All Kinds Weather there as well. In All Kinds of Weather on Facebook. And before we go any further, definitely be sure to smash that subscribe button, like this video, comment your thoughts on Florida and Central Florida down below. Dustin, welcome back to the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast, man. How's it going? Neil, it's going great. I know during the bye week, we ran the model and it did super well. Absolutely nailed that big time matchup with Alabama and Georgia. Picked Alabama by nine. And the fact that Bama won by seven in that game, big time for the model. And certainly by the time we get to the end of this pod, we'll be giving our prediction and I'll be giving you what the model thinks in terms of the matchup between Central Florida and the Florida Gators. Should be awesome. Yeah, man. Looking forward to getting into all that. We got um, we, we know that when we have you on the show, we're going to have more analytics and and data even than than Chris and I do. So before we get into any of that, though, got to take a second to shout out our sponsor. The In All Kinds of Weather Forecast is proudly sponsored by 401k Generation, the wealth management company that helps you invest today for your future tomorrow. Their team of advisors is committed to providing guidance and education for your 401k plan and its participants. And they also offer a range of enrollment solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your company's 401k plan. Whether it is saving for your child's college, investment advice, or retirement, 401k Generation's team of advisors makes getting to know you their top priority. Their advisors will tailor a path to assist you in lifing life in navigating life's financial milestones and reaching your financial goals. That is 401k Generation, building stronger futures one generation at a time. For more information, contact them at 866-998 Five eight seven nine, or visit their website at 401kgeneration.com. Also, for anyone wondering why I'm a bit more dressed up than usual, tonight begins the Jewish New Year. I'm heading to services immediately after this recording. So to all the members of the tribe, all the fellow members of the tribe, Shana Tova Uvmetuka, Uvetuktuva, Besefer Chaim, Happy Sweet New Year. May you be written into the Book of Life. Billy Napier probably isn't going to be written into the Book of Life, at least not in any metaphorical sense in his Gator tenure. Um, I don't believe he has a whole lot of life left in Gainesville, Florida. A disastrous season opening loss to the Miami Hurricanes, followed by arguably an even uglier loss to Texas A&M two weeks later before going on the road and beating a really bad Mississippi State team. But nonetheless, could have lost the game. They didn't. So they, you know, it's better than the alternative putting the Gators at two and two as they head into this game that Gator fans and Central Florida Golden Knight fans have been waiting for for a while because the Central Florida Golden Knights come to Gainesville for the third time ever. That's right. The, the fake 2017 national champions and the genuine annual world champion mouth runners are coming calling to the swamp. And what a storyline this would have been I think, Dustin, in any other situation, if if this Florida team was even just a plain bad football team and not an absolute dumpster fire like they are, I think that that would be the focus, and this game would have so much more heat to it than it probably does. And maybe it still will for a few hours on Saturday night, but at this point, if you're looking at the Gators' schedule, you don't see a whole lot of wins left. I yeah. do think FSU is worse than Florida, if that's even possible. But Billy Napier is also 1-8 and eight in rivalry games, so he very well may find a way to lose that one too. Anyway, first things first, the here and now. Dustin, you live in Orlando. You know that fan base better than most. What are some of the storylines you're looking for in this football game? 
Yeah, no, without divulging my specific location, I am literally six miles away from the campus of the University of Central Florida, and it's very quiet around here, and I, I've not seen any UCF flags fly, UCF, I mean, it, it's uh, it's rather funny to be, to be in, in, in this territory, but I just have to say this, there, there's no luckier team in America than Central Florida. The last time Central Florida played the Gators, it was in Tampa. It was the last game of, I, I guess Mullen was no longer the coach at the time, but it was the last game of that tenure. Um, and then obviously the next season we had Napier come in. And then this is arguably and, and, and probably, and it could be the last game of Napier's tenure. It's really interesting how it all plays out. Certainly, the expectation is if Florida loses this game, it's probably Napier's final game. And uh, w w it remains to be seen what exactly happens, but certainly I'm really looking forward to this matchup. And Florida should win on paper. They look to be the better team. But, Neil, you and Chris have spoken about it all season. Florida has looked to be the better team in all its matchups so far. Florida should be undefeated right now, just given the talent alone. But the coaching staff, namely Billy Napier, they've not coached this team. And they've had game in and game out a failing grade when it comes to coaching. And for that reason, though Florida should win, they're probably not going to win. And so, you know, we could certainly get into the numbers. We could get into the X's and O's. We could get into the advanced metrics. But... All that doesn't matter. All that matters is Billy Napier is still the coach for the Florida Gators. And if that's the case, which is the case, something that shouldn't happen is probably going to happen. And that's going to be an L for the Florida Gators. Yeah, that's uh, – I mean, that that's another way of saying – kind of restating my thesis for the year, which is – well, I'll back up. For last year, 2023, my thesis of the Gators was good teams find ways to win games, bad teams find ways to lose games. Well, the Gators were five and seven. They lost more games than they won. That was a losing football team. Now it's year three and it wasn't just a bad year or just another painful growing stepping stone for the Florida Gator football program. This program loses games under Billy Napier. That's my thesis for him as a football coach, at least in the SEC. He is a loser. And for those new listeners, we do pick up new listeners, new followers, new subscribers every week. We appreciate all of y'all. So for those of you who haven't heard me explain this before, it's not meant in a playground, like sticking your tongue out and going, yeah, 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 kind of like childish way. It's a go Google his record way. The guy has lost more games than he has won at the University of Florida. That is the definition of a loser. He is a loser in terms of being the Florida Gators head football coach. So Dustin's right in that I don't know what form it's going to take. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to be the defense giving up 700 yards of offense again or the special teams lining up with two guys wearing the same jersey number or if it's going to be one of the dumbest play calls I've ever seen like we saw against FSU or if it's just us getting beaten up and beaten down in the trenches like we saw against Miami this year and Kentucky last year. But it, there will be something that happens throughout the course of the game that's going to result in Central Florida having more points than Florida does. And that's something that I think we have to talk about. Florida has not won a game in the swamp against an FBS team in an entire calendar year. <laughs> oh my it was October 7th, 2023. And by the way, that was Vanderbilt. That was the last time that wow. Florida won a game in the swamp against an FBS team. It has been nearly 365 calendar days. In fact, it will be 364 calendar days on Saturday because it was a leap year. So the October 5th would be like October 6th. That is an entire year, an entire revolution of the sun or entire revolution of the earth since Florida has last beaten an FBS team on its home field. They lost to Arkansas since then. They lost to FSU since then. They lost to Miami since then. And they lost to AM since then. Sanford does not count as that is, that is an FCS team. Also, if Florida loses this game, Billy Napier will have lost as many games to FBS teams in the last five games that he coached as Steve Spurrier lost in the entire 12-year tenure at the University of Florida. So just, just, just think about that. 
Steve Spurrier coaches at Florida for 12 years. He loses five games. Billy Napier loses this one, and he will have lost five consecutive home games to FBS teams. To even be on the doorstep of that, to even sit one loss away from that statistic is disgraceful. Mm. Now, that's just where we are. And there's a reason that we've gotten to this point. Um, and it's because of what I just talked about a second ago, in that you don't know the form it's going to take, but something is going to go wrong. For example, it could be the defense, which just gave up 480 yards to Mississippi State, which is not coincidentally, by far the most yards that Mississippi State's offense has racked up in a single game all year. And they played Eastern Kentucky and Toledo, who, by the way, clobbered them. So that number is bad enough. 480 yards of offense surrendered is bad enough if it's Alabama on the other sideline. Now take that down to a horrible Mississippi State team who couldn't even hit the 450 mark against Eastern Kentucky. And that's just a calamitously bad performance on defense. Florida for the year is averaging 425 and a half yards a game allowed, which, by the way, is 112th in the country, which is on pace to be the worst total defense ranking in school history. Florida is also specifically terrible against the run, ranking 109th in rush defense with 188.8 yards a game allowed on the ground. And on the other side, Central Florida has one of the best running games in the country, which makes for a terrifying matchup. Gators going to have their hands full with RJ Harvey, a name that if you don't know already, you will know soon on Saturday night. Already 525 yards on the ground this year for the Central Florida Golden Knights. And as a team, Central Florida had the best running game in the country, the number one running game in the country until that Colorado game. They came into it averaging better than 375 yards a game before Colorado beat them up last week. As it stands right now, still number two in the country, still with 326 yards a game on the ground. So safe to say, they're still really good at running the ball. And on the other side, they're also good at defending the run, only giving up 80 yards a game on the ground, which is good for 11th in the country. Now, they haven't played anyone good other than maybe Colorado, but still, Florida got pushed around a lot against a really bad Mississippi State team. And even Sanford had their way against Florida in the trenches on some plays here and there. So Central Florida clearly did better against their cupcakes than Florida did against theirs. The one thing that I will say about Central Florida in this this abbreviated show um, that we're previewing the game is their secondary is pretty suspect. If Florida is going to win the game, that's probably how they do it. They're going to beat them through the air. But the Golden Knights are really good at clocking the box under defensive coordinator Ted Roof, who came back to reunite with Gus Malzahn after Oklahoma fired him after the end of 2023. Last thing I'll say before I hand it over to Dustin and let him give his analysis, is that we also know the right side of Florida's offensive line is awful. Um, another continuing storyline for me, Billy Napier did say he has found a starting five that works. I will counter that by saying that I don't really care what Billy Napier has to say anymore. I don't trust him. I don't respect him. And I'm not going to believe another word he ever says unless I can independently verify it with my own eyes. If you remember, Billy Napier, this, this was Chris's statistic, Napier has never recruited and signed a single offensive lineman who was ranked in the top 100 of his respective recruiting class. To be fair, Roderick Kearney was pretty close, but even if you were to give him Rod Kearney, that would still be one in three years unacceptable to say the least also has probably got a lot to do with why the shoes of Michael Tarquin and Ethan White from two years ago have never really been filled on Florida's offensive line central Florida for their for their um, side of things not really monstrous in the trenches but they're not awful either and so that means advantage golden Knights because Florida is awful there and the last thing that I think a lot of fans are talking about specifically from Florida side is something that I'm going to hand over to Dustin and let him analyze because this is his position says the Gators are going to continue to utilize a two QB system for the rest of the year, which to me, I, I don't think that's helping anything. It, it's not the biggest problem Florida has, but it's just not making things any easier to me, Dustin, you are though the former quarterback here. So floor is yours, man. What do you think of the Gators QB situation right now? 
Yeah, Neil, great analysis. When you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. And the big issue, we've said it all year, the big issue of Billy Napier is he is not a tactical football coach. He's done a pretty good job in some regard in terms of building an army, uh, building a staff. He's a pretty decent GM, but he's not tactical. And the problem is we have excellent quarterbacks. I think Graham Mertz is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the country. And I think if you give him a decent offensive line, I think he'd be amongst one of the better quarterbacks. You put Graham Mertz on Alabama or Georgia, and I think he's one of the front runners for the Heisman. And I'm not even joking. I mean, he he has the skill set. He has the talent. The problem is he's not athletic. He can run a little bit, but we saw in his in his final play of last season that when he tries to run the ball, he may get some yardage, but he's he's not built like Tim Tebow, and he can't expect to be Tim Tebow. He might wear Tim Tebow's number, but he's not Tim Tebow. On the other side with Lagway, Lagway is a generational quarterback. Lagway has the upside of, I mean, you name it, Cam Newton uh, in terms of running the ball and, and Tom Brady throwing the ball. You think I'm joking? He is that kind of generational talent. Maybe I'm exaggerating there, but still. Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. But what I'm trying to say, Neil, is we have two great quarterbacks who could be excellent uh, given a tactical coach. But the problem is two quarterbacks is really no quarterbacks. And the problem is when you put one quarterback in, you're basically telling the defense what you're trying to do. Generally speaking, if Lagway's in the game, you're, you're simplifying the offense a little bit. You're either throwing the ball downfield or you're running the ball with the quarterback or you're handing the ball off. You put Graham Mertz in and 90% of the time, it's either a handoff, an RPO possibly, and more than likely, it's a, it's a bubble screen of some sort. And when you're telegraphing to your defense just by who you're putting out there on the field at quarterback, then you're already doing the entire team a disservice. So do I think the quarterbacks can play well against UCF? I think so. But you're basically telegraphing to the defense what you're going to do by putting that that specific quarterback out. So to me, that would be perfectly fine and dandy if you tell Central Florida's defense exactly what you're going to be doing if you don't think that they can stop it. But our offensive line only has two pieces on it that are capable of blocking consistently for long enough for that quarterback to do his job. So that doesn't matter who you have a quarterback. It doesn't matter if you to, to take your exaggerated take a moment ago, if you were to have Tom Brady, you still have a, a sieve on the right side of the offensive line. That's not going to give your receivers time to run their routes correctly. It's not going to give running backs ample room to go anywhere eventually they're going to figure out you can only run off the left side of the line. If they don't already know that going into the game, they'll figure it out pretty quickly. And that shuts down the entire offense. But so, I mean, you can't, you can't say that you, you can't say that Florida has the ability to tell central Florida, Hey, here's what we're going to do. DJ Lagwage in the game. So you know that either a deep ball or some kind of mobile uh, or some kind of RPO or something where he rolls out and beats you with his legs, you know one of those two things are probably coming. It, it doesn't work like that if you don't have an offensive line that can give them the time to do what they're supposed to do. But that's, to me, that, that's that's a secondary thing. Like I said a moment ago, is the QB situation the most damaging component of the team? No, it's not. But this is not going to do you any favors, especially once you get into the meat of your SEC schedule, which again, we have to point out Florida remember is two and two in the easy part of the schedule. But anyway, the problem with rotating quarterbacks to me is even if both of them do have success, which is the big if, but even if they do, you take one of them out of the game and out of this rhythm, he can go cold. He just seconds ago saw that hole in the defense. He just Moments ago, made that great throw. He's hot. He's making plays. He feels good. He's building momentum. He's building confidence. He just throws a touchdown pass. All of a sudden, sits down on the bench, and he cools off. Time elapses, and more time elapses as the defense inevitably gets run over again on a long touchdown drive by Central Florida's run-first, pass-later, if-ever, offense. 
And then the other quarterback comes into the game and he cools off more and he cools off more as more and more and more time elapses. And then the next time he comes in, he's lost that momentum. The heat that was proverbially coming off of him, if you can think about that, that, uh, that metaphor is gone. It's cooled off. He doesn't have that hot hand anymore, especially if it's the freshman DJ Lagway. Graham Mertz, a little bit less so because he is the senior, the cool, calm, collected guy that could come into bad situations and get you out of them with his game managerial skills, but especially if it's DJ Lagway. Now, I've been on record saying that Lagway is the better QB, but if you want to go with Graham Mertz, then fine. I disagree, but okay, fine. Mertz is the high floor guy who's going to protect the ball, generally going to make good decisions, probably is not going to lose the game for you. He, he's not a bad quarterback. And I think that if you're going to claim that you need the senior leadership at quarterback all year long as this team goes through its growing pains, like I said, I disagree. I would rather go with the freshman who can learn and grow and get better and be here in years to come. But okay, agree to disagree. Fair enough. I think the spark Lagway is capable of providing makes him worth the risk, but it's a reasonable opinion to think otherwise because once Burks gets into a rhythm, he can pick apart a defense 10, 15 yards at a time. The absolute dumbest thing you can do is rotate them in and out. Well, Steve Spurrier did it. Well, guess what? Napier is not Spurrier. He's significantly less creative of an offensive mind and significantly more brainless of a play caller. And if you want to go to the Urban Meyer, Chris Leak, and Tim Tebow uh, comparison, it's the same thing. Because Urban Meyer knew how to utilize both of those guys to their strengths. Leak threw a great deep ball, a beautiful spiral. Tebow was that battering ram who could suddenly step up, step back, and all of a sudden he makes a great throw now and then. Napier is not smart enough to know how to do that. The play calling is at least 90% similar when they're both in the game. So, Billy... I'm I'm exasperated even just thinking about this. Billy, listen, dummy. The point of having two quarterbacks out there is to have them do the different things that make them really, really good. It's not to play recreational ball where everyone is guaranteed X amount of playing time. It's to utilize the two different quarterbacks, each with a different skill set, to do different things that even if the defense knows is coming, to Dustin's point a minute ago, even if they know it's coming, they can't stop it. You, I mean, like you said, Lagway is a generational talented quarterback. He throws a great deep ball. He's also very quick, can run away from a lot of guys who come after him. Central Florida can know what that the offense is going to look different with Lagway in the game, but that doesn't mean that they can stop it if Florida were to have the offensive line, like I talked about a moment ago. So what you don't do with the two different guys with different skill sets is have the same man in motion before the snap, ostensibly to figure out what the defense is doing, which doesn't even matter because the offense is so unimaginative before calling Montreal Johnson running plays that get blown up because the right side of the line didn't do its job for the fifth time in that drive, along with the spot, the same four or five combinations of pass routes that opponents have already seen on tape. And yet that's exactly what I fear he's going to do. Now, the last thing I'll point out is central Florida also has big problems. Um, the, the main issue I saw after watching the game tape against Colorado is KJ Jefferson just doesn't see the field well at all as a passer, or at least he didn't in that game. The Golden Knights had receivers get some separation in that game. Jefferson just didn't see him, never pulled the trigger. So Colorado could shut down their running game, force them to throw, and Jefferson couldn't do it. And between that and turning the ball over, they never had a shot. A lot of the fans were also kind of sick and tired of Ted Roof, who honestly sounds a little like Napier at this point in terms of talking about getting better and moving on. Um, after a bad loss, the difference being that Roof actually has a very good run defense, like I said a moment ago. So there's at least something that his defense does right. It's really just mostly through the air that they get shredded, which, you know, having to tackle Travis Hunter is going to do that to you. But still, at least there are elements of the defense that do its job. So, Dustin, let's talk to the other side. KJ Jefferson. We've seen him before. He's coming back to the swamp um, in different colors this time. But what do you think about what he can do as a both passer and a runner against this Florida defense? And what are you expecting to see the Gators do against him? 
So the big thing with Jefferson is he's big and he's fast. And we saw when he played for Arkansas last year how often he made plays. And and, and the worst part about Florida's defense is they do fairly well on first and second down. But it's always that third and seven, third and eight, third and nine, where something stupid happens and we give up a big-time play. We saw it even against, according to the model, the worst team in the SEC in Mississippi State. Game in and game out, we we give up plays to quarterbacks on third down, and I don't think that this game is going to be any different. I think K.J. Jefferson is going to he's going to make a game out of it. He's going to make plays on third down that that cause all of Gator Nation to scratch their heads. And look, Ward absolutely looked like a Heisman candidate against Florida, and he, he probably is a Heisman candidate, okay? And we saw it again with, with Texas A&M's quarterback. Made him look like a Heisman candidate. He's awful. Freshman, okay? And his first ever start, by the way. Exactly. Marcel so, Reed. So K.J. Jefferson, who has experience – making mincemeat out of the Florida Gator defense, okay? Similar scheme. I know we got a slight shakeup on the staff with, with Ron Roberts, but it's pretty much the same scheme. K.J. Jefferson is going to make mincemeat out of the Florida defense if we're not careful. So that's my analysis. I'm, I'm, I'm worried. I don't, I don't want to be a worry wart. That, that's not who I am. Neil, you know me very well. I, I tend to be very positive, but I'm definitely worried about that matchup. I wouldn't say I'm worried either. I just I know what's coming. And yeah. so I'm I'm resigned to it. <laughs> right. I mean I, yeah, either or. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been calling a loss in this game since um well, I, I've been I've been definitively calling a loss in this game since Texas AM two weeks ago. I've I've been earmarking this game as the game that probably gets Napier fired with a loss since really the offseason, even even before Miami beat us. I, I had worries about this. But I mean, in any case, this is a game where Florida is the more talented team. Like we said at the top, the Gators do have more talent than Central Florida does. But also, like you said at the top, that doesn't really seem to matter, does it? Florida was more talented than Texas A&M, and they got blown out by them. Florida Florida was more talented than Miami. Now, they weren't more talented in the most important position of all, the trenches. Miami was more talented than Florida there, and they showed it in spades. But pound for pound, Technically, according to the 247 Sports Composite, Florida was more talented than them, and the Gators were leaps and bounds more talented than a Mississippi State team that really only one play separated them. It was that fourth down stop because they couldn't execute on that speed option pitch. If if that's a touchdown, if, if Pup Howard, even if he does his job, if Blake Shapin pitches that ball right and it's caught in and it's walked in for a touchdown because the block was there, that game plays itself out of a lot differently. They first, for one thing, they don't go for the onside kick that Florida recovers. And then the, when the Gators get stopped, it's not a field goal. Like they wound up kicking with Trey Smack. It's a punt because they would have been way at their own end of the field. And then when Mississippi state, I mean, granted it was with their backups at the end when they drove down to the one yard line, but it wouldn't have been their backups. It would have been their starters flying right down the field on Florida's defense again for another touchdown. So that game was a lot closer than the three scores made it look. Point being, the talent disparity hasn't made a damn bit of difference in a single game that Florida's played against FBS opponents so far. Why should we believe it will in this one? So I, I'm, I'm done being the negative guy for the show. Um, I, I think it's time to, to, to wrap it up and, and give some final analysis. Dustin, I mean, anything I've talked about, anything you've talked about, anything you haven't, talked about anything that we haven't talked about at all on this show yet what else um need, needs to be said about this game between the gators and the golden knights i don't think really anything needs to be said neil i think that like yourself we've resigned to the fact that this coaching staff is on its way out and that this team by and large recognizes that and it, it's certainly frustrating we certainly wish this game ha was happening in other circumstances, certainly Florida on paper is the better team. And I could I could go up and down the advanced stats. I can go up and down the recruiting rankings. None of that matters. Florida is going to find a way to make this game a lot closer than it should be. 
Yeah, and it's 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 games that play out that way when you let a team hang around in a game they probably shouldn't be in for very long that it gets tighter and tighter and the nerves get a little more and more intense in the stadium. And then you get to the fourth quarter and it's a one score game one way or another. And you let that other team hang around long enough. They can indeed make that play to win it at the very end. Like Arkansas did a year ago with the same quarterback at the controls of their offense as the central Florida golden Knights will have at the controls of theirs. So that said, like I said, it's an abbreviated show today. I have to run a synagogue. But final, uh, or the, the verdict, as we call it, the final word for our, our recap shows. The verdict. Dustin, your keys to the game for the Gators are what? You know, very rapid fire. I'm going to give you an offensive key and a defensive key. For offense, we got to get 100 air yards or more. I'm tired of this side-to-side passing game. We have to throw the ball. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the term air yards, it's simply the distance the ball travels through the air when it's thrown, uh, not just the yards that the receiver will make once they catch the ball. And then on the defensive side of the ball, it's very simple. We have to hold UCF, Central Florida, we have to hold them under 200 yards on the ground. I think if we do that, we have a solid chance, but more than likely we're not. More than likely we're going to give up those big third downs. More than likely we're going to give up those big rushing yards. They are going to eat us alive in that phase of the game, and that's really difficult to say, but it's probably going to happen. I mean, it's embarrassing to even think about. It. I'm I'm already pre-embarrassed for what I know is going to happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, look, if Florida, if Florida, I, and I can't believe I'm even going to say this, if Florida has a chance to win, but if Florida wants to have a chance to win this game, they have to stop the central Florida running game, load the box, stop the run and dare them to beat you through the air. And as an extension of that, stop KJ Jefferson from scrambling. If he drops back to pass and your secondary does its job and there's either no one open or he just doesn't see anyone open and he takes off with his legs Stop them. If the Golden Knights can run the ball, either by traditional methods, like with handoffs or jet sweeps or counters or whatever, or with Jeff- Jefferson improvising and scrambling, Florida's going to lose. And that's probably the easiest prediction I'll ever make in my life. So stop them yes. from beating you on the ground and you've got a puncher's chance. And then the other two, I'll go a lot quicker. Force field goals in the red zone, kind of similar. If you stop the run, you'll probably keep them out of the end zone. We know that this is a horrible Florida defense. So the best we can hope for is just bend, don't break, as opposed to just completely shatter. And the last one is win the special teams. And honestly, special teams hasn't been a huge problem yet this year. But with the way that Billy Napier works, it just feels like he's conditioning me for a letdown on special teams in the most catastrophic and shocking way possible to lose this game to Central Florida. So Dustin, get a piece of paper, get out your phone or something. We do this differently this year. Um, We write down our scores on a piece of paper or an iPad or something so we don't um, spoil it for the other one. So I have my score written down right here. And on the count of three, whenever you're ready, we hold them up and we show them. Well, there's a caveat Along with your percent chance to win. Yeah. Well, Dale, there's a caveat for mine. I have mine written down. It's actually typed out. It's via Mm -hmm. the and all kinds of weather forecaster model. But I am actually going to, for the first time ever, I'm going to amend my score in live time. And you, the math is right there, so you'll see. But it's it, it's written out. (laughs) All right, ready to show it? Yep. All right, here we go. Uh, my green screen. I can't remember. Yeah, there it is. So I have Florida losing 38 to 28, and I have Central Florida with an 80% chance to win the game. I have to do something about this. There we go. Yes. Now, now, now people can see it clearly. All right. Yes. So 38-28 Central Florida for me. Dustin says, although, wait, who does it say you have winning? I don't see a team. I just see the score. Yes. Yeah, so the model has – Florida winning 34-27, and that is completely because of the home field advantage the bottle gives to Florida. Central Florida is actually power ranked just a little bit higher than Florida. 
uh, just by 0.4 points. So here's for the first time ever, Neil, I'm going to actually disregard the home field advantage and I'm going to pick Florida to lose the game, Central Florida to win the game by the score of 31 to 30, 31 to 30. And you you can actually see the math on the screen. So if you look at where Central Florida's power ranked, you can see how the math works out. No, you you, you can't call them UCF. You got to call them Central Florida. It pisses them off. We, we got to have something to feel good about this weekend. I call them Central Florida. The model the model goes with what collegefootballdata.com calls them. So oh, fair enough. It's all it, it makes it makes the stuff quicker. If you like if you like college football data, go to that website. You will uh, you'll nerd out like I do. Well, I, one more question before we wrap up. How how does your model take into account the fact that Florida just absolutely sucks on its home field? Like they've lost four straight games to FBS opponents on their home field for the first time in God knows it's got it's got to be three quarters of a century. How does your model take in, that into account? That's the problem, Neil. Right now, it doesn't. But it looks at historical averages for how teams have performed at home over the last ten years, along with an assumption that. Night games are typically a little better. If a home team playing a better opponent uh, generally favors the home team because they're going to be hyped up for it. But the Florida Gators really have no home field advantage. And the funny thing is it has nothing to do with the crowd. The swap is electric. The swap is routinely there. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, Florida just doesn't perform well at home. It's real funny that two of the best performances this year uh, have been on the road. Really, one Mississippi yeah, State. The other one was against a uh, Sanford an FCS, count. an FBS FCS team. So, well, I mean, Florida sucks on the road too. I mean, Napier's won three games outside of Gainesville in in two and a third seasons. So that's not really great either. I mean, technically, his home record is better, but you're supposed to have a better home record than a road record, especially when you're in the SEC. But in any case, that's our show today. If you liked it. Please like, please subscribe, leave a comment down below. Tell us why we're wrong as to how Florida is somehow going to find a magical way to pull out a win here or agree with us and tell us that we're right. Either or we want to hear your comments. We want to see what you have to say. Uh, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review on Apple Podcasts. Wherever you listen to your podcast, this show will be available for you. Um, Dustin, I will see you in the swamp on Saturday, won't I? Actually, I have a schedule conflict, so I won't oh, be in no. Gainesville this weekend. Oh no! Well, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be there, and I'll see Chris there. So if you if you see Chris or myself, uh, be sure to say hi. Tell us what you like or what you want us to do better. What you don't like about the show? We always appreciate feedback. And um, Dustin, we'll we'll try to bring home a win against Central Florida, but I doubt we'll have much luck, given that this team can't really beat anybody aside from teams that get smacked by Toledo. So until then. Y'all stay safe, stay healthy. Shout out to Avada, all the fellow members of the tribe out there, and go Gators.